It's good to see you tonight, and if you would please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we read this evening, beginning with the first verse, down to verse 11. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare... Go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers who have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the Spirit of our God, let's ask God's blessing on our time tonight in His Word. Father in heaven, we thank You for the truth that in a world of darkness, You have brought us into the light. You've made us light in Your Son. And God, You've given us an understanding. You've given us Your Spirit. So that we might understand the things given to us by you. So that we might understand the things found in your word. Help me tonight, Lord, to declare your word in a way that's fitting and right, pleasing to you. Lord, ultimately, that's our desire tonight. Our desire is not to please man, but to please you. And so, Lord, help us to that end. And, Lord, help us tonight to listen to give you our full attention, not to be distracted, not to be a distraction, but to cooperate together with the preaching of your word in such a way that we would be receptive and that we would, Lord, have our lives challenged by what you say to us here. Lord, my desire and our desire is that your church would be washed tonight with your pure word, that, Lord, we would be built up and edified in our walk with you. And we continue, Lord, to ask on behalf of those who don't know you, that you would save. Show yourself mighty and present here among us tonight, Lord. You are the living God. You save. You change lives. And we ask you to do that work in your people and through your people tonight. We love you, Lord. We thank you that we belong to you. And We freely acknowledge that it's all of grace. We give you praise for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our view of church discipline is based on our view of what the church is and what her future is. Let me say that again, and I want you to think about if you've ever thought of this this way, if you've thought about church discipline this way. Our view of church discipline will flow out of our view of the church and our view of what her future is. It's amazing that 1 Corinthians 6 is often 
dealt with in a way completely disconnected from chapter 5. It's almost like you're leaving in the way that the sixth chapter is handled. It's almost like you're leaving one realm, moving to an entirely different realm. What I hope for us to see tonight is what is wrong in, in going on in the church in chapter 6 is vitally connected with what's wrong in chapter 5. Both problems flow from the fact that these people were not looking at themselves properly. Their view of the church was inadequate. And as a result, their response to sin in the church and their response to personal grievances was a disobedient one. It's all flowing out of a misunderstanding of the church and of the church's future. This is why the man in sin wasn't dealt with properly. This is why their personal grievances were not being dealt with properly and an adequate view of the church. Now, where I want us to begin tonight is with the problem that we're facing in chapter 6. It appears that Paul perhaps has a specific case in mind. And the problem is you have believers taking each other to court. There's someone who's been offended and there's an offender. And instead of dealing with the matter in the church, instead of allowing the matter to be judged in the church, remember how he ends chapter 5. Verse 12, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Isn't there a judgment that takes place inside the church? Now, when it comes to personal grievances, instead of those matters being judged in the church among the saints, they're going outside the church, into the pagan courts, into the court system. And they're engaging in lawsuits against each other. That's the problem. This represented a couple of things. This represented a refusal to recognize their new life in Christ. In other words, they're just dealing with their problems, their legal issues now the same way they would have if they were lost. Nothing has changed. They're just going on as if they never met the Lord Jesus Christ, as if they weren't a member of the Lord's church, as if they didn't have God's truth at their disposal. They're just going on settling their personal grievances in the same way they would have if they didn't know Christ at all. So it's a refusal to walk in the newness of life that's theirs in Christ. At the same time, it's, it represents them being pushed into the world's mold. They're being conformed to the world because this is how their world dealt with these issues. And so they're just walking in step with the world around them. John MacArthur commenting on this text says this, he says, the text reveals they were envious of fellow Christians, critical of fellow Christians, and took business and financial advantage of each other. They carried these things so far as to take each other to court, and secular pagan courts at that. They hung out their dirty laundry for all the world to see. This is really just an example of the church becoming like its world. The situation in Corinth was probably like the situation in Athens. In Athens, litigation was a part of everyday life. It had become a form of challenge and entertainment. One ancient writer claimed that in a manner of speaking, every Athenian was a lawyer. When a problem arose between two parties that they could not settle between themselves, the first recourse was private arbitration. Each party was assigned a disinterested private citizen as an arbitrator, and the two arbitrators, along with a neutral third person, would attempt to resolve the problem. If they failed, the case was turned over to a court of 40 who assigned a public arbitrator to each party. Interestingly, every citizen had to serve as a public arbitrator during the 60th year of his life. If public arbitration failed, the case went to a jury court composed of several hundred to several thousand jurors. Every citizen over 30 years of age was subject to serving as a juror, either as a party to a lawsuit or as an arbitrator or as a juror. Most citizens regularly were involved in legal proceedings of one sort or another, close quote. So there you have sort of the cultural picture. This is going on all the time in their culture. It is a form of challenge. It is a form of entertainment. This is how you solve your personal differences. And the believers in the church at Corinth 
Nothing had changed in their life. They were still doing the things they had done when they were lost, still handling their personal grievances in the same way that the lost world around them handled the problems. So this is the problem facing us. Now, the second thing I want you to notice here is not just the problem. I want you to notice the seriousness of the problem. I mean, what's amazing about this to many in the modern church is how Paul reacts to it. Because, in fact, it seems he is so incensed, he is so angry, he doesn't so much engage in, in an argument here as he just shames them. I mean, he rebukes them, he shames them. In fact, he engages in sarcasm. Biting sarcasm. He describes it in verse 1 as daring. What they were doing is daring. He says, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? And the word dare there in the Greek is in the emphatic position. Dare you do this? How dare you? He says, this is daring what they're doing. Taking each other to court. He describes it as ignorance. Verse 2, or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Verse 3, do you not know that we're to judge angels? I mean, down in verse 9, do you not know that the, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Three times, do you not know? I mean, are you acting here without knowledge, without understanding? This is ignorance. This is daring and this is ignorant. Third, he describes it as shameful. Verse 5, so if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. In fact, if you read the book of 1 Corinthians, you know, one of the things that this church gloried in was the idea that, there, that they had wisdom, right? Right? Wise people. This is one of the things that they're culturally valued. Wisdom. Talk about sarcasm. He says in verse 5, I say this to your shame. Can it be there's, not, there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? You talk about all your wisdom. Is there no one there wise enough to do this? It's daring. It's ignorant. It's shameful. In fact, he says in verse 7, they already lost. The moment they went to court, the moment they took each other to court, they were already defeated. Verse 7, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. You've already lost. You just don't know it. Even if you win in the courts, you're a loser with God. Don't you know this? Now, let's just pause here for a moment. Let's ask this question. Does this ever happen today? I mean, are there believers, professing believers, taking each other to court to settle civil matters, to settle disputes among themselves? Does this happen? What's the answer? Absolutely, it's happening. My question is, our question is, do we respond to that with the same horror and outrage that Paul did? Do we consider that to be daring How dare you do that? Do we consider that to be ignorance in action? Don't you know? Are there things you don't know? Do we consider it to be shameful? This is a shame. And do we consider it to already be a defeat? In our thinking, do we say to ourselves, they've already lost? No matter what the outcome is, they've already lost. So this is the problem, and it's a, in in Paul's view... God's view, this is a serious problem. Paul is not expressing a personal opinion here. He, he is, the, the, the Holy Spirit is giving us this through him. This is God's view of it. Serious. Now we come to the third thought, and that is the reason why this problem is a serious one. Why is Paul so outraged? Is it really wrong for believers to to go to court to settle a dispute, pagan courts? What's so bad about that, right? 
And I want to tell you what's bad about it and what's wrong with it and why he's outraged in general terms first. And then we're going to consider some specific things. In general terms, what outraged him so much was that what they were doing was, was an admission that they failed to recognize that they are a unique group of people, a unique community of people, belonging to the Lord with a unique future. They are the Lord's people. And they have a future that God has destined for them. And who they are and what their future is should be ruling and guiding them in the present. And their present actions reveal that they didn't get it. Now, let me apply that to us for just a moment. Do you realize that when we know who we are as the church... When we understand what it means to be a child of God, what it means to be a follower of Christ, a Christian, what it means to have the Holy Spirit, what it means to be the community of God's people. And when we understand what our future is, do we know that that is to guide us right now in our present actions? And if our present actions are no different than they were when we were lost and if we're being pushed into the world's mold, the real problem is we don't get it. We don't understand who we are in Christ, and we don't understand what our future is. That's their problem. That's why he's outraged. If they had really understood who they were and where they were headed, they would have acted differently right now in the present. Gordon Fee Commenting on this, I thought he had some outstanding insight here. Listen to what he writes. He says, crucial to the whole argument is Paul's view of the church as an eschatological community whose existence as God's future people absolutely determines its life in the present age. The absurdity of the Corinthian position is that the saints will someday judge the very world before whom they are now appearing and asking for a judgment. Do you get that? You're going to judge the world you're asking for a judgment from. Not only does such an action give the lie to who they are as the people of God, but it's done in the presence of unbelievers. The very people to whom the church is to be God's alternative. The two great urgencies for Paul are the church's self-understanding as God's eschatological people and its witness before the world. The difficulties with our hearing this text are related primarily to our general lack of a biblical self-understanding, especially in terms of the essential eschatological framework of our existence as the people of the future who are to be totally conditioned by that future as we live in the present. Fee is saying the reason why we don't react so violently today as Paul did to this is because we don't understand who we are and what our future is. That's what he's saying. And that we're to be totally conditioned in the present by what our future is going to be. He goes on to say this, therefore our priorities tend to be warped toward the values of this age rather than the age to come. Close quote. So this is what... Has Paul so upset? They, they don't understand who they are, where they're headed, and how that is to dictate how they act right now. So in specific terms, what were they missing? What were they missing? Notice the things that he notes here. First of all, they missed the fact that one day they're going to reign. And they're going to be judging. Look at verses 1 through 3. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare to go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? Don't you know we're going to 
rule and reign with the Lord Jesus? Don't you know we're going to judge the world? Don't you know that one day we will even have a part in the judgment of angels? But we can't settle our matters amongst ourselves. We can't take care of our problems in the company of the saints. We have to go to court before unbelievers. Don't you understand the future reign of the saints? Second thing they were missing. The trivial nature, the trivial nature of things pertaining to this life. I mean, really, how important were the things they were going to court over? How important is it really? You notice how he describes these problems that they were ending up in court over? He says in verse 2, Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try? How does he describe them? What does he say? Trivial cases. Trivial cases. Notice how he describes it in verse 3. Do you not know where to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to what? This life. You see that? The things pertaining to this life compared to the things we'll judge one day? The things pertaining to this life are what? Trivial. Trivial. By comparison, these things don't matter. These things we get angry over. These things that we engage in battles over. These things we war to own and possess. Material things. These things that we end up in court over. Don't you understand these things? By comparison to the things we're going to judge one day, these things don't matter at all? Don't you know you're going to judge important things one day and these things aren't important? There's a third thing they had missed. They had missed the priority of the church's witness. What's most important is not the stuff you're battling over. What's most important is not you winning. What's most important is the Lord's name, the Lord's truth, our gospel witness to the world. Look at verse 4. So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother. And this is what is really shameful. Notice, and that before, what did he say? Unbelievers. Man, you are you're taking your problems to unbelievers. As MacArthur said earlier, taking our dirty laundry and hanging it out for all the lost world to see. Where's our witness? Do we understand the priority of the gospel? Do we understand the priority of the truth? Do we understand our witness to the world? Is it worth going to court when you're going to lose your witness? There's a fourth thing they were missing in all of this. Remember, remember what all this has to do with generally. If we know who we are and where we're headed, it ought to guide us right now, right? So they're, they're missing their future reign, their ability to judge things. They're missing the trivial nature of things pertaining to this life. They're missing the priority of being a witness for Christ. Here's the fourth thing they were missing. They were missing the competency of the wisdom given to the church. He says this, doesn't he, in verse 2. He says, and if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases he says in verse 5, can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between brothers? I mean, do you really believe that you've gotten to the point that you don't have the wisdom to deal with these things? Are you really incompetent to deal with such trivial matters? I mean, and again, I want you to see, he's just shaming them, isn't he? I mean, he is outraged at this. 
There's not one wise individual among you who could hear these cases. There's, not, there, there, there's no one who has the wisdom of the Lord who could guide you through this. Does the church, listen, does the church have competency given to it by Christ with God's word? Does the church have the competency to settle disputes between brothers? What's the answer? Yes. But when we go to the courts, what are we saying? No. We're saying to the pagan courts that we don't have the wisdom, we don't have the competency given to us by God with his word to settle these things. And think about it. When you go to the pagan court system, you have judges hearing the case, generally speaking. Not, of course, every single judge, but generally speaking, you have judges who do not have the Holy Spirit. And in the pagan court system, the law that is applied is not the law of God. It's the law of the land. In this case, Roman law. So the word of God is not what's brought to bear upon the case. And the judgment of God is not what we're looking for. But rather, in this case, the judgment of Rome. And it is a judgment without the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God. And this is about disputes between brothers. There's a, four, there's a fifth thing that we're missing. They were missing the truth of winning and losing as God sees it. Verse 7, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Brothers, when we can't settle our disputes, when we can't sit down and talk with one another and find a place of submission to the Word of God, and the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God, when we can't ask for forgiveness when that's needed and give forgiveness when that's needed or say, let's come together to the Word of God and find out what God says about this, when we can't do that, we are already losing. To go to court is already to be defeated. And then he says something shocking here to most people. He says, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not? This is strong. Why not rather be defrauded? You know what he's saying there? Before you go to the pagan courts with a problem involving another brother, talking about civil matters, not talking about breaking of the law, That sort of thing. Talking about a a dispute, about things that could be settled in the church. He says, before you go into a pagan court to have that settled, why don't you just take it? It would be better for you to be wronged than to do this. Now, folks, we just have to let God's word speak, don't we? We can try to argue around that and rationalize that and get around that all we want to. What did he just say? Why not rather suffer what? Wrong. Why not rather be what? Defrauded. If you take this to court, he says, you've already lost. In fact, he says in verse 8, instead of suffering wrong, you yourselves wrong and defraud Even your own brothers. And that lets us know what they were doing. They were taking advantage of each other. Taking advantage of their brothers in Christ. So, this is why he's outraged. This is why it's such a serious problem. Because they're missing the truth of who they are, where they're headed. And it's not reigning and ruling in in their present activity. You're going to judge the world one day. Don't you know that? The things of this life are trivial by comparison. Don't you know that? The, the number one thing is your witness to the world. Don't you know that? There's the wisdom present in the church with God's word to judge these things. We're competent to do it, to, to help each other settle disputes. Don't we know that? 
And if we take it out to the world and we're taking advantage of each other, we've already lost, no matter what the court says. Don't we know that? But then he moves to one other thing they were missing. The spiritual realities that are wrapped up in all of this. Verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, I don't want you to miss this. Verse 9, we've got to go back to, to verse 1 to keep in mind how he's using this word unrighteous. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare to go to law before the what? Unrighteous. So he's talking about lost people. Verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. I have to admit to you, when I first looked at those verses, I mean, what connection does that have with what he's just been saying? This warning, don't you know, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes through this list of of sins that characterize lost humanity in many cases. And he says, don't you know, these, these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. I think there's a couple of reasons he reminds them of this. First of all, it's a reminder of the type of people they're now setting their disputes before. Here you have God's people going before the unrighteous, verse 1, going before the unrighteous for judgment. So who is actually hearing your case? Lost people. What characterizes lost humanity? Well, sexual immorality. Idolatry. Adultery, homosexuality, thievery, greed, drunkards, revilers, swindlers. And here are the saints going to the adulterers and the homosexuals and the revilers and the swindlers and saying, will you help us settle our differences? Is that not striking? Not only that, but when you're taking advantage of one another, you're acting like them. Or you're acting like who you used to be. Because notice what he says in verse 11, and such were some of you. It's not that this is an exhaustive list of sins, it's not. But even the sins he's listed, some of us sitting here tonight, this is who we were. But that's not who we are anymore. We've been washed, haven't we? We've been set apart under the Lord. We've been sanctified. We are those who've been justified, declared right in the sight of God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of his suffering for our sins, because of his payment for us. Because of the imputation of his righteousness. The Lord has saved us. So why do we go to court having differences with one another as if we were lost? As if we were still in darkness, as if we didn't know the truth. We've already lost. There's something else. We see here, and that is, if you take the whole passage together, there's a fourth thing, the remedy for the problem. What's the answer? What's the answer? The answer is, don't do this. The answer is, recognize the realities that Paul is bringing before us. Act like who we are. Stop shaming the Lord's truth. Stop shaming the Lord's church in public. Let us come humbly. Let us come submissively. 
Let us come with the wisdom of God's word to our disputes. And let's let the Lord settle it. And if you and I can't settle our dispute with the word of God, then let's get a saint with wisdom from God. And let them hear our case. Or let's get a company of saints with the word of God and let them hear our case. But let's not go to the unrighteous for their judgments. The re- let, let, me, uh, let me close with a few observations that I think tie these two chapters together. Isn't it amazing? These people were tolerating wrongdoing in the church, but they would not tolerate wrongdoing toward themselves. To put it another way, they were not moved to action when God was offended in his church. But they were moved to go to court when they were offended personally. Now, how could that happen? That you could let sin go on in the church and not deal with it, but you would not suffer wrong individually and go to court over it. That happens when you're not God-focused, you're self-focused, right? Second thing that these two chapters have tying them together is in both chapters they're dealing with wrongdoing in a fleshly way instead of in a spiritual way. Taking matters into their own hands. Dealing with it according to their own wisdom instead of according to the instructions set forth in God's word. When it had to do with the man with his stepmother in the church, they were refusing to hear God's instructions. They were acting in accordance with their own thinking, what they thought was best. And when it came to personal grievances, instead of going to the word of God for his wisdom, acting in faith, They're handling the matter as it seems best to them. In fact, in the same way they did when they were lost. Not in a spiritual way, in a fleshly way, not in faith, but in human wisdom. In both chapters, they were failing to recognize that the church is able to judge itself. Unwilling to judge the man in sin in the church. Unwilling to judge their disputes with one another before saints. Unwilling to judge. These two chapters are not disconnected, are they? What connects them is a wrong view of the church, a wrong view of its future, and a wrong view of allowing the truth to reign in the present. Do we see believers doing the same thing today? Do we see the church not judging sin in its midst? And do we see believers going outside the church with their disputes? Why does that happen? And this is not an exhaustive answer, but I want to suggest four reasons why we're seeing this. One reason is the church is not insisting on a regenerate membership. The church is saved people, beloved. Lost humanity does not belong to the church of Jesus Christ. Only saved people do. Let me tell you why that's important. Saved people will submit to spiritual regulations. Lost people won't. You can appeal to a saved man with the word of God. A lost man won't hear it. So one of the reasons we're not able to judge sin in our midst, and you see professing believers going outside the church with their disputes is because they're not willing to submit themselves to a spiritual judgment. May not be saved. That may be why they aren't willing. Second, the church not willing to discipline its membership has led to both of these things. Sin not being disciplined in our midst because we're unwilling to discipline the membership of the church. We're like the Corinthian church. We know the instructions. We know what to do. The issues are clear. We just won't do it. And then because we won't judge sin in our midst, our people learn incorrectly, but they learn not to try to settle their disputes in the church anyway. We go outside the church because the church won't deal with our issues. The church won't deal with our disputes. 
third reason this is happening is because we don't understand ourselves. We don't understand our privileges. We don't understand our provisions. We do have wisdom from God. We do have the truth. How dare we go to the unrighteous for our guidance when we have the saints equipped with God's word. But the ultimate reason why the church won't deal with sin in its midst and why it goes outside with its problems is because we don't have a passion for the glory and truth of God. If we have a passion for God's glory, we deal with sin, don't we? We do individually and we do corporately. Why should you deal with the sin that God reveals to you, to you in your life? Why should you deal with it? Why should you slay it? Why should you mortify it? Why should you say it, call it what it is? Why should you repent of it? Because you love the Lord. And because you have a passion for His glory. And because anything hateful to God is hateful to you. And why should we corporately deal with sin in our midst? Because we love the Lord. We have a passion for His truth and a passion for His glory. And whatever grieves Him grieves us. Should you not have mourned over this, Paul says? Shouldn't it break your heart? May the Lord lead us in such a way, tonight even, that where we recognize that which grieves Him, we would confess it and forsake it. If there's anybody here tonight, because, because I don't know, perhaps there's someone here tonight that you've got some civil dispute and you've gone outside the church. Would you see that that's wrong? You and another brother going outside the church with your dispute? Would you submit it to the saints? Would you submit it to the truth of God's word? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that your word speaks so clearly. And I thank you, Lord, that we, we need to hear it. Not try to modify it to fit our lifestyle or our comfort. But, Lord, rather we need to hear it for what it is, your word, and submit to it that we would please you. That we would act in faith. That we would act in the light of who you've made us, what you've given us. And as unbelievable as it is to us, Lord, that we would act in light of what our future is right now. Lord, I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters in this place. Lord, reveal to us where our lives are not in accord with your truth. And Lord, as you do that, and you are faithful to do that. Lord, I pray you would encourage us and help us and strengthen us to put sin away in all of its forms. Where we have disputes with one another, Lord, lead us to walk in humility. That we would care more about your name than about winning a dispute. That we would rather be wronged. We would rather be defrauded than to dishonor you in any way. And Lord, where there is the absence, the absolute absence of humility and that desire to glorify you, Lord, I pray that we would even be willing to ask whether or not we know you. And Lord, where there's the absence of true salvation, we ask you to save. We ask this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.